Well, good evening, everyone. It is uh, great to be able to welcome you here to Great Vic this evening as we uh, just look to gather together to worship the Lord. We have been uh, going through um, our series through the book of First Thessalonians, and tonight, again, we're going to see that there is so much encouragement to be found in God's word, in God's truth, as it roots us, as it grounds us, as it speaks to us of the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus. Uh, And so we're really looking forward to just continuing to work through that uh, together this evening. There's so much encouragement to be found um, as we gather in this way, as we gather around God's word and as we sing and also pray uh, truth together as well. This evening, it's great to have Paddy uh, preaching for us. So we're looking forward to to you uh, doing that a little bit later on. Thank you for preparing and bringing God's word to us. Many of you will know Uh, There's a football match happening in just a little bit, so if you would like to uh, stick around after the service, we're going to have a few of us have some snacks just in the crash room beside. Uh, If you want to endure that with me, you're very welcome uh, to do that. Um, uh, Briefly to mention, um, as I mentioned this morning, just giving advance warning that um, from August uh, through to the end of October, our service times are changing. So uh, we're moving from 7 o'clock in the evening service here to 630 Likewise, in the morning, half an hour earlier, from 11 o'clock to 10.30. That's hopefully a few, uh, few weeks' notice for you to get that uh, uh, noted. I know a few people go away over the, these months as well. So if you're not back around until August, then please just make note of those different uh, service times. This week, on Wednesday, we have our regular prayer meeting, 7.45, um, here at the church. Great to have Matthew Boyd coming to speak and to lead us uh, for that as well. Uh, And then finally, just a reminder that as Judy mentioned this morning, uh, we're working our way, we're getting set up for Bounce, which is our um, outreach week um, into the local community. Um, So uh, uh, we need some people to help flyer on the Thursday and the Friday evening before that. That's the 25th and the 26th of July. So if you're free, um, either early evening or late evening, uh, one of those nights, then uh, please do, there's a, there's a sign-up sheet at the back, pop your name down there, it would be great, we'll just gather together here at the church and then go um, out and put some flyers through uh, the de- different doors there, so do uh, make note of that if you're able to come and help with that, that would be great, and do keep in your prayers at that week as well, um, over the next little while. Everything else I think uh, you will find in our bulletin, so do have a look through um, that later on as well. This evening, um, as I mentioned, we're in uh, continuing our series in 1 Thessalonians. And in chapter 5, one of the verses that we're going to read, we're going to read that as Christians, we have put on the breastplate of faith and love. And for a helmet, we have put on the hope of salvation. The hope of salvation. And so for our call to worship, I want to take us to Psalm 42. Um, And here we see the psalmist just calling out to the Lord um, and calling out and saying, calling for himself, speaking to himself to once again put his hope in God. And that's what we can remember as we begin this evening. Psalm 42, verses 1 to 6, reads like this. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God. For the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down? O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. As Christians, we have great reason to hope in our God, even in the midst of turmoil, even in the midst when we do find ourselves cast down. And the greatest reason we have for hope is because of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. And that is what we're going to sing about uh, in the words of our first song. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Let's stand together and praise the Lord.
just continue to worship the Lord as we come before him in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do come before you this evening in praise and in worship of who you are. Father, Son, and Spirit, you are glorious in holiness. You are mighty in power. You are resplendent in glory. This evening, if we were to see you for who you are, we would be like the prophet Isaiah, who seeing your glory fell to his knees and cried out, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst a people of unclean lips, and have my eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. Lord, that is truly what we would be like in seeing your glory this evening. Because, Lord, we are not like you. We are, as Isaiah said, those who are unclean, those who have said things that have dishonored you, who have done things that have dishonored you, who have thought things that have dishonored you. And so, Lord, we do come on our knees this evening. And yet, Lord, we thank you that as we come, as we confess our sin to you, that you do welcome us to you. Lord, because as we ask for your forgiveness, we can look to the cross of Christ. And we do that again this evening. Lord, we thank you for even what we've just been able to sing together. That because of Christ, we can boldly now approach your throne. Lord, that is an incredible reality. Who are we 
to approach you, a holy God, and yet you call us to come. And so, Lord, we thank you that as we gather this evening, we can do that. We can come and approach you together as your people. Lord, we thank you for the great encouragement and blessing of being able to do that week by week here as a church. And Lord, we pray that this evening you would meet us where we are at. Lord, there are many of us here this evening who, like the psalmist, perhaps do feel cast down, who feel in turmoil. There are so many reasons for that in so many ways in our lives. And yet, Lord, we thank you that as we gather this evening, we can remember that whatever it is that would have us be cast down, that would put us in turmoil, yet, Lord, there is hope in you. And so together this evening, we say we will hope in you. We will hope in you, Lord. We shall again praise you our salvation and our God. And Lord, we thank you that as we've been reading in 1 Thessalonians, we have that great hope that is to come of the Lord Jesus returning. And Lord, yet you have also called us to live here in the present. And Lord, we thank you that you have in the present then also given us good works to do. And so we pray this evening that as we do read from your word in just a moment, as we hear from it uh, later on, as Paddy brings it to us, Lord, would it spur us on to keep running the race? Lord, that we would finish the race and we look to that day when we will come into your presence and you will say, well done, good and faithful servant. So Lord, please be with us this evening. You know how each of us comes. And so we just open our hearts to you and we invite you to come into our hearts again and and our lives and just be at work amongst us. We pray all these things for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are going to have our reading now. Joanne's going to come and bring for us uh, the reading from 1 Thessalonians at chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Thanks, Joanne. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 to 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons brothers you have no need to have anything written to you for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security then sudden destruction will uh, will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another, and build one another up, just as you are doing. Amen. Thank you, Joanne. Well, we're going to sing of that salvation that this passage uh, speaks of now as we sing our next two songs, By Grace I Am Redeemed, and I Will Sing the Wondrous Story. This gives us great opportunity, doesn't it, to sing praise to the Lord, but also, like this passage calls us, to encourage each other as we sing to each other, of all that we have in the Lord Jesus. Let's stand together and sing. Your grace is 
take a seat again. And Andrew Nicholl is going to come and lead us as we pray uh, for our world, for our land, and for our church. And then immediately after that, Paddy's going to come and bring God's word to us. Thanks, Andrew. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight knowing that you are sovereign, you are good. You know all things and nothing is beyond your sight. And Lord, with this in mind, we come to intercede for our world, our nation, and our church. Lord, as we look out to the world, we pray for the nations that we often don't hear about. Lord, for the the countries in Central Asia, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan, Lord. In these Muslim countries where Christians face various degrees of persecution, we pray for the believers there. Lord, may you strengthen them. We pray that you will bring the lives of people in these nations to faith in you. And that we and we ask that you would send your people to reach the unreached. Lord, for our nation, as we have a new government in Westminster and an existing one in Stormont, Lord, you know how we are often so discouraged by the leaders that we have, but you have commanded us to pray for them, and so we do. Lord, may you give them wisdom and integrity to rule well. For those leaders themselves, Lord, may you convict them of their sin and may they come to fear your name. For the churches across our land, Lord, may you proclaim your word through the pastors that you have called. May the gospel go out and be heard. And Lord, for our church, as we gather here tonight, we think of those who aren't able to join us, those who aren't able to leave their their home or their nursing home, Lord. There are many of them, but just for a few, Lord, we, we ask for your intercession. Lord, for Millicent Bailey, we pray that you would be with her as she's returned home recently, Lord, after many months in care. We just pray that you would help her to cope For Maureen Frizzell, Lord, as she has moved into nursing care, we just pray for her, pray for her daughter who cares for her and travels back and forth from England to see her. For Tommy Sterrett, as he is cared for at home, Lord, we just pray for him, that you would comfort him, that your peace would be among him. And for for David and Georgina Graham, Lord, may the, your presence just be with them. And Lord, we know there are many more, and we just ask that you would help us as a church to care for those who can't be with us as they would love to be. And Lord, just as we look out into our city, we look in on ourselves. We just ask that more than any of these things, that you would help us to look to you. We just ask you would give us a renewed vision of your holiness and your glory, that we would set our minds on the things above, not just on the things of this world. And Lord, as we come now to hear your word, we just ask that by your grace, you would help us to receive it. In your name we pray. Amen. It is good to be able to open up God's Word with you again. Uh, This evening, we're continuing our series in 1 Thessalonians, and we'll be looking at chapter 5, verses 1 down to 11. And I want to start with two questions. The first being, how often do you think about the day of the Lord? How often do you think about Christ's return? And then the second question, 
how do you how does what you think about the Lord's coming, the day of the Lord, shape the way you live? How does what you think about the coming day of the Lord shape the way that you live? I start with these two questions this evening because our passage is going to answer them. And it's going to answer them in this way, by saying, knowing that you have been made ready for the day of the Lord makes you live soberly and steadily as you wait. Knowing that you have been made ready for the day of the Lord makes you live soberly and steadily as you wait for his return. We always seek to see this thrusting point by breaking our section, our our passage up into two sections. And the first section we'll look at will come in verses one to five. And here, we are taught how to rightly think about the day of the Lord. We're being taught how to think rightly about the coming day of the Lord. In verses one and two, Paul continues in the thought that we've seen last week about how he's encouraging believers about the coming day of the Lord. Last week, he was focusing on those who have died and encouraging those who are alive to be encouraged that they are secure in Christ. And this evening, we're going to see that Paul now turns to the living and seeks to encourage them not to worry about the coming day of the Lord because they are secure in Christ Jesus. He wants to encourage them to take heart that they have been made ready for the coming day of the Lord, and that will shape the way that they live. And so in first. One, Paul starts this encouragement by dismissing the notion of needing to know the exact date of Christ Jesus' return. He says, don't concern yourself with the times and the seasons, brothers. That idea of knowing exactly when Christ will return, but rather focus on what you do know, knowing that the day of the Lord is coming, that Christ will return, and he will return like a thief in the night, meaning that he will come when people are unprepared. For the thief uses the element of surprise. They use the the darkness of the light to rob people who are unprepared. They catch the owners asleep and unprepared. And you know this, and so therefore, focus on what you know Think about how the Lord will return like a thief in the night and will take people by surprise. They will be unprepared. Why will they be unprepared or why will it be a surprise for them? Well, verse three further expands that for us because Paul says that people will be under this false pretense of peace and security. They will think that everything is okay. They will not be aware of this coming day but suddenly destruction will come upon them in an instance and there will be no escape. Think how Jesus talks about the coming day. He likens it to the day of Noah's when the people were eating and being merry and drinking, having no care in the world for the coming judgment of the Lord. And they were unprepared for the flood and they were destroyed in an instant. Or think about the analogy that Paul gives us in this verse about a woman going into labor. The woman doesn't choose when she goes into labor. As many people know, the baby comes when the baby wants. Paul is saying, likewise, the day of the Lord will come when the Lord ordains it. He will come like a thief in the night, bringing destruction, and there will be no escape. There will be nowhere to hide in this sudden destruction, this coming of the Lord. People will be exposed to the glory of Christ, which to a believer sounds glorious, to behold the glory of Christ. But to be outside of Christ, to behold his glory, is a thing to be fearful of. It's a terrible situation. Think of the words of Revelation 6 that we've seen when the lamb returns and those outside of Christ, what do they say? They start to call upon the mountains and the rocks 
They say, fall on us that we may be hidden from his face, from him who sits on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb. Paul is saying there's a day of the Lord coming and there'll be sudden destruction. We are not to dismiss this as fiction, but fact. The day of the Lord is coming and you know this, take heed. But then verse four reveals the light of hope and encouragement that the believers can have. For just like in Noah's day, there was an ark of refuge, there will be an ark of refuge on the day of the Lord. And that ark of refuge will be Christ Jesus himself. In verse four, Paul reassures the believers at Thessalonica that they are not of the darkness. And so therefore, the day of the Lord will not surprise them like a thief for they are all children of the light. They are not of the darkness, but of the day. They are not of the night. And so they have the light of Christ that illuminates, gives them sight to see the coming of the Lord and it be a joyful thing. Think about what Paul's saying here. It's like saying that Christ, with Christ you have security lights. What's the purpose of security lights? It's to stop there being darkness that your cameras can't see, that the thief cannot use the darkness to sneak up into your house. Just likewise for the believers in Thessalonica, they have Christ, the light of the world, and therefore they have the light to see the coming day of the Lord. And then they are to be reminded that in Christ they have a refuge. In him they have been made ready for the coming day of the Lord. He prepares them for that day by becoming their ark of salvation. And so as they think about the return of the Lord, it's not one of fear and dismay, but it's one of hope and rejoicing. They can rest securely in knowing that the flood of God's wrath will not affect them because they are in Christ. And so we see Paul trying to instruct the Thessalonica believers about this coming day of the Lord, that it will come like a thief in the night with sudden destruction for those who are in darkness outside of Christ, but those who are in Christ, they will have light and will not be one of fear. And so as we look at these first five verses, I want us to think back to that first question, How do they instruct us to think about the coming day of the Lord? And I want us to make a couple of observations, three to be precise. Firstly, I want us to see from these verses that we are being taught about the reality that the day of the Lord is coming. We must affirm the reality that the day of the Lord is coming which may sound like a no-brainer to us who are believers, but think about the world that we live in. They deny that there is a God. They suppress the truth that there's death. Think about it. They, They seek to numb themselves with the amusements of this world. They seek to maximize pleasures in this life so that they can be distracted about the coming death and to be distracted about eternity. And so from these these verses, we must affirm the reality of the coming day of the Lord. And just like the world, sometimes we can fall into forgetting about the coming day of the Lord. We can live like it's just the here and now. And so let's ask some questions to think, have we fallen into this trap that we've been so absorbed with the here and now that we've taken our eyes off Christ's return? Let me ask you, how often do you dwell or meditate upon the return of Christ? Think of those words in 2 Timothy 4 and 8. Will they be true of you? It says, they will receive the crown of righteousness who loved his appearing. Are we people who love and long for the appearing of Christ? Or maybe you're in between. You, you know that the Lord's coming back, 
but you live in such a way, it's just like, Lord, if you can come back in maybe like 10 to 20 years, I still need to go see that view or the northern lights, or I still need to get married. I need to have kids. Are you practically living in darkness and like the unbelievers? Are you practically longing more for the pleasures of this world than the pleasures of the world? Have you in one way prioritized good gifts over the good gift giver? That somehow they have come in and they have distracted you. They've been a blockage before the sun and now you live in the shade. Let these verses remind us, no, we should be those who love the appearing of the Lord. Another way to think about this, think about our prayer lives. How do our prayer lives reflect about what we think and prioritize when it comes to the Lord's return? Can we say with the apostle John in Revelation that we pray often, come Lord Jesus? How often is that your prayer that you long for the Lord to return? Or are you so caught up in the things of this world? These verses are teaching us to love and long for the appearing of Christ. Let them then take your eyes off the things of the world and reorientate you to eternity. May we long for Christ to return that we may dwell with him. Secondly, then, we see a warning in these verses that the day of the Lord will be a day of destruction for many if they do not repent and believe in Christ. We live in a season, a time of patience and kindness where the Lord restrains his wrath, but the Lord will not relent forever. His patience and kindness is not to be abused, but it is to lead to repentance, as Paul says in Second um, uh, Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. These verses make it clear that if you do not know Christ, on the day of the Lord, all that awaits you is destruction, wrath, and eternal sentence to hell. And we see those words, there will be no escape. Don't suppress this truth as fiction, but rather hear these words as a driving means that you would go to Christ, the light of the world. May you no longer live in the darkness, but turn from sin and misery and come and find refuge and rest and righteousness in Christ. Though there's a warning that the day of the Lord will come with sudden destruction. It does not have to be like that. You can come to Christ and you can transform the day of the Lord from one of sorrow and misery to one of rejoicing and hope. Now, a second layer to that, maybe we know Christ. How then does this warning impact our lives? Surely it makes us zealous for evangelism. When we recognize that this is fact, there is coming a sudden destruction for those who do not know Christ. This must stir us to long to see people, to know Christ, to talk of Christ, to be a light for Christ wherever we are. We should long to see people brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved Son. This warning should drive us to evangelism. And then maybe a practical implication of that could be that you prioritize the prayer meetings. Why did I say a practical implication from being zealous for evangelism is the prayer meeting? Well, where do we gather to seek the Lord's power and strength to do the work of the Lord? It's in the prayer meeting. We gather on a Wednesday evening to seek the Lord's power and spirit upon us that we may be a light in Belfast. And so if your heart is heavy as it should be when you hear the warning of this, these verses, come to the prayer meeting and intercede for our city that we would see the kingdom of the light of God grow across our city. Let this warning stir us to long to see people 
plucked from the kingdom of darkness that they may know the sweetness of Christ. Think about the revival in New York in 1885. How did it start? It started by businessmen coming and having a prayer meeting. I think the first prayer meeting had six people. And if you read of that account, hundreds, if not thousands, are saved through these faithful people interceding for their city, for the lost, that they may be brought into the kingdom of God. And then the third observation we see from these verses, we must see the hope that these verses instill in those who trust in Christ. These verses remind us that we are not like the unbeliever who is under the false pretense of peace and security. No, rather we have a certainty that there is no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. And so therefore, when he returns, it will be one of celebration and rejoicing. He will return to take us home. <laughs> Let that stir your affections and long for it, for Christ to come means for us to be liberated from these sinful bodies and get to spend eternity with him. Why? For the Holy Spirit has made us alive in Christ. We have been born again. We have been shown the bitterness and the, the folly that the pleasures of this world offer, and we have tasted the reality, the sweetness of the Lord in the gospel message. Let this then stir us to long for more of that tasting, long for more of that communion, that communion that's no longer by faith, but by sight. Maybe a helpful illustration of how this hope builds longing and a tasting of wanting more is to think about Micah, my son. Um, so I gave him some chocolate a couple of weeks ago. Um, don't tell Charlotte. Um, <laughs> And he tasted it, and you've seen his eyes, and he's like, well, that's glorious. And see, every time I come into the living room with a cup of tea and a chocolate bar, he wants more of that chocolate. He's got a taste for the sweetness and the goodness of the chocolate bar, and so he rushes and he wants more. And that's what the believer should have. When we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, we should want more. We shouldn't say, ah, oh, it's okay, I got some of the Lord last week. We want more. We want to know the fullness of it. We want to have the consummation of it. We want all of it. We want Christ in his full glory and beauty. We want him to come back so that we can delight in the feast of feeding upon Christ for eternity. That's what it's going to be like. That imagery of the feast of this awesomeness that stirs us to long for him. It stirs us to be able to pray those words of John sincerely and loudly. Come, Lord Jesus, come. When you have tasted the Lord, you want more. And so let the thinking from these verses stir you to long for more of the Lord. And so pray that he would return so that we could taste fully in eternity, so we can commune with him. And so, to go back to that question, how have we been instructed to think about the day of the Lord from these verses? We have been taught that we are to long for the day of the Lord, for his return, and for our being taken home. For in Christ, we have been made ready. That's why we can long for his return because in Christ we have been made ready. We go then to see how this impacts the way that we live in our second section, verses 6 down to 10, where we are shown how we are to live sober and steady lives as we wait for the Lord. We see in verse 6, they start with these words, so then, and they function as connecting 
what is being said to what will be said. They ground us back in all that we've seen in verses 1 to 5 and give the foundation for what Paul will call us to do in verse 6 and onwards. Paul is grounding the believers sober and steady living in the believer's identity. Because they are off the light and off the day, he calls them to act as those who are off the light and the day. And he's all used these two characteristics. They are to be awake and sober in contrast to those in verses 7 who are asleep and are drunk. But what does Paul mean by these two characteristics of being awake and sober in contrast to those who are sleeping? Well, he expands his thought in verse 8, telling us that those who are sober are those who have put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope of salvation. They have put on the armor of God. And they have as their helmet this hope of salvation. And verses 9 and 10, then Paul logically grounds the hope of our salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that the grounds, the guarantee of the Thessalonian believer's salvation and our salvation in verses um, 9 and 10 is the sovereign will of God to have elected, or to use the language, destined them for salvation in Christ Jesus. The guarantee, the foundation of the hope of their salvation is that before the foundation of the world, they were chosen in Christ for salvation, not for wrath. And this salvation is not based upon God's foreknowing that somehow you would have faith and that's why he chose you, or that he looked down and he hadn't seen something worthy in Patty. There's nothing worthy in us for him to choose us. Paul is reminding them that the salvation and the fuel for their holy living is all of grace. It's according to God's sovereign good will. This salvation is a gift. It is accomplished for us by Christ who dies for us. And then he grounds it so that whether we live or die, nothing can separate us from our gods. It's a hundred percent sure because of Christ, and therefore we can have certainty and encouragement off that last clause. Whether we live or die, nothing can separate us from our God because of Christ. I think it's so fitting that Paul grounds the guarantee of our salvation in Christ's death, in him being our propitiation, our atoning sacrifice, taking the wrath of God upon himself in our place on the cross. Why is it fitting that he sones in that Christ died for us? Well, think about what he's just said about the coming day of the Lord. What will come? There will come destruction and wrath. And so someone will have to pay for that. Someone has to receive that destruction and wrath because God is holy and he cannot sweep sin under the rug. But what does Paul do to encourage the believers? He says, remember Christ, the heart of the gospel, that he took your sin, your destruction, your wrath upon himself. He emptied it. He paid it in full. And now there's no condemnation for you who is in Christ. Therefore, his coming isn't a fearful thing. In him, you have redemption through the shedding of his blood. And so therefore, you can delight in the truth that we've seen last week with Connor in verse 17 of chapter 4, and we see in verse 10 that we will always be with the Lord, whether in life or death. Nothing can separate us from our God because of Christ, because of the accomplished salvation he gives to us. He doesn't give us 99.9% and say, there's just some for you to keep going. Just keep going until the end, and, and then you get that 100%. No, 
No, Paul is saying that we receive a full salvation in Christ Jesus, and so therefore we can be assured. We can have a firm foundation to rest upon and to be the fuel for our sober, steady living. And so, as we take these truths, let's think about how they shape the way that we live as we wait upon the Lord. How do these truths that we've seen in our second half shape the way that we live as we wait upon the Lord? Well, firstly, I want us to notice the sandwich that Paul serves up for us. The sandwich that Paul serves up for us for the best fuel for our living while we wait. What do I mean by this sandwich? Well, think about what we've seen, the structure of this passage. In verses 1 and 5, Paul reminds the believers of their identity. They are of the light. They are of the day. And then skip down to 9 and 10. What does Paul remind them? The grounds for their salvation. It is of grace. I love the acronym by Shailen. What's grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. So the grounds of their salvation is not because of themselves, but because of the objective truth of Christ's finished work on their behalf. And then what do we see in the middle? A call to sober, steady living in verses 6 and 8. And so I say this sandwich because it gives the analogy of what does food do? It nourishes us. It gives us energy. And so Paul gives us this sandwich with the call being in the middle. We are to see that our fruit grows out of the truth of the gospel. Think about it. You cannot have fruit if you do not have root. You must be rooted in something. The plant needs to get nourishment so that it can bear fruit. And what Paul is doing in this passage as he calls us to live soberly and steadily, he is giving us the soil on which we put our roots in. It's the gospel. It's our identity. We do not live so that we may have a new identity. We do not live in such a way to gain our salvation. No, it flows out of who we are. We live as those of the light because we are the light. We live in the hope of our salvation, not to gain it, but because we have received it. And so Paul here is showing them that the nourishment for the so then, the calling of them to live, is grounded in the objective truth, meaning the certainty of the truth of the gospel. The gospel spurs on our living distinct sober lives as we wait on the day of the Lord, as we wait for Christ's return. So what's the first thing? The impacts are living, we must know the nourishment. We must have the fuel. And so if you remember anything, remember the sandwich of Paul. Those pieces of bread and the meat is the call, but it's grounded in who you are and what Christ has done for you. And then secondly, I want us to see what does it practically then look like? What does this fuel us to do? Well, we see that we are to be those who are off the light off the day, meaning that we are meant to have distinct living in contrast to those of the darkness and night. Christians' lives are shaped differently in light of the coming day of the Lord. We see that this distinction, this different living flows from our being awake. Our being awake then leads to our living soberly. And so let's think about these two characteristics that are meant to be seen in believers as they wait for the coming of the Lord. Let's firstly think about what it means to be awake in contrast to those who are sleeping. What does Paul mean when he calls us to not sleep as others do, but keep awake in verse 6? Well, it's the difference in being spiritually alive and spiritually dead. Those who are alive in Christ are watchful. They are prepared, ready for action, unlike those who are dead, who are asleep. They're ready for nothing. And this preparedness, because we are alive, helps us understand the warning and call of verse 6 better. 
because it says, do not fall asleep as some has. Do not go back, meaning we are to be watchful. We are to be active. We are not to drift or be lured to asleep. We who are alive in Christ are to be awake. We're not to go back like the dog to his vomit. No, we live distinct lives as those of the light. But what would it then look like? What does the warning Paul is saying here about not falling back asleep? We must affirm that you cannot lose your salvation. That's not what Paul is saying. He is not saying you're now of the light and then you can become of the darkness again. No, he's calling us to actively seek to put on Christ. But there is a reality how believers can drift. Um, I like the analogy Steve always uses about how it's like the swimmer in the river against the tide. If you stop, you start to drift. And Paul's saying, do not stop because you think Christ is to return. And so, hey ho, let's just not do anything. I can just sit here. I can chill. I have all I need in Christ. No, Paul is saying, be active, be prepared, live in light of the goodness that Christ is returning. And so I think it's helpful just to think, what does it look like so that we can fight against being lured back to sleep? I think J.C. Ryle's words are helpful here. He says, men fall in private long before they fall in public. The tree falls with a great crash, but the secret decay which accounts for the fall, is often not discovered till it is too late and it is on the ground. This being lured to sleep starts in private long before it becomes public. The temptation and enticement to go back happens when you become lax spiritually. You start to wander from the things of God. You no longer sow the seed of the Spirit, but you allow the seed or the weed of the flesh to sprout back up. You no longer personally read your Bible or meditate upon the Word of God that you hear on the Lord's Day. You no longer depend upon the Lord in prayer, but you rather seek to go on your own way. You no longer prioritize the the Lord's Day and the ordinary means of grace. And why should we be surprised if someone lives like this that they become cold towards God? as they walk further and further away from the warmth of God's presence, verse 6 reminds them that they are going back to that darkness. And so it's a warning, don't do that. Don't continue in sin. Live new lives. As John says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. How can we keep on sinning who have been made alive in Christ? And so Paul's not saying, or John's not saying that we're desiring perfectionism, that somehow that you will never sin. He's saying, no, stir those flames of new affections, of the new nature. Delight in being alive in Christ. Delight in the goodness and the privilege that the gospel gives you. Delight in meditating upon the word as you wait. Delight in praying to God and communing with him. Delight in gathering with his saints in the Lord's day as you look to his return. Let's come hungry and thirsty, as Psalm 42 reminds us. Let us have a soul that thirsts for the living God. Let us not become dull as we wait upon the Lord, but let's stir that fire of affections. Let us live, let us be alive as we wait for Christ's return. We have been made alive in Christ. Let us enjoy it by living soberly. And so to be awake means to be alive and to delight in the things of God. And then we see this idea of living sober lives. Verse 8 helps us understand what it is to be sober. It is to put on the armor of God. It is to see that the greatest defense is offense. Offense. To be awake and sober is to have faith and love that is anchored in the hope of salvation. To put on the breastplate of faith and love should make us think of walking in the Spirit, faith working through love, faith joining us to Christ, who gives us the Spirit, who enables us to love, love God and love neighbor, to put on 
the fruit, not to put on, to produce the fruit of the Spirit. That's what it looks like to live sober lives, the fruit of joy, peace, kindness, self-control. We here off the light should reflect the light. We have been joined to Christ, the light of the world, and so therefore we should reflect him. Think of chapter 4 and verse 3. We are not to pursue the passions of the flesh. Rather, it says, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Or think about chapter 5 and verse 23, where we're told that God, the power for this is God sanctifying you, and he will sanctify you completely, that you may be kept blameless for the day of the Lord. And so we are to see that as we wait for the Lord, we are to take the encouragements of the gospel and live soberly and steadily dependent upon the Lord's strength. That's why it's the Lord's armor that he's giving us. It doesn't point anything to us. It points outside to Christ, his love, faith joining the hymn, and the hope of the salvation that we have in him. And so, as we wait for this returning of Christ, let us not only delight in the righteousness that is accounted to us, but the truth that Christ is making us more righteous and that one day we will be truly glorified. How then does the coming day of the Lord shape the way we live? It spurs us on to seek to live lives that reflect who we are, children of the light. And just to finish then, I want us to look at verse 11 and see the whole purpose of these verses. It says that we are to encourage one another and build one another up. These truths and instructions to live are to encourage us. We are to delight in the truth that we have been made ready for the day of the Lord because of Christ. And because of the sureness of this hope in Christ Jesus, we live in light of eternity. We are called to be watchful and delight in living sober, steady lives until the Lord returns or calls us home. In Christ we rest. He is the foundation. He is the hope of our salvation. He is the fuel for our holy lives. Let us seek to know him more. Amen. Let's just pray before we sing. Father, we long to know you more. We long to delight in you more. Help us to see Christ more clearly, to know the hope of our salvation more surely, that we may rest there, and that resting in Christ, we may be spurred to live God-glorifying lives as we wait for you to return and take us home. Help us to take our eyes off the things of the world and to look to you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. We'll stand and sing our final hymn, Amazing Grace. Let's stand and sing as the musicians start to play.
us hear the words of 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 to 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept, kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen.